To stay up to date on all the voting rights and election news you need, click on the link above to subscribe to Democracy Docket's daily and weekly newsletters. The Republican Party has yet another hypocrisy problem. They are encouraging their members to vote early and by mail, while at the same time, they're sending their lawyers into court to roll back mail-in voting access. Welcome to Defending Democracy. We're your hosts. I'm Mark Elias. And I'm Paige Moskowitz. Let's get started. In August 2023, the RNC launched a new program called Bank Your Vote to promote early and mail-in voting. They don't want their supporters to wait until Election Day to cast their ballot. And this is a new stance that we've heard from the RNC, given everything they've said about mail-in voting over the past four years. So, Mark, why are they doing this and is it going to be successful? Um, they're doing it because it makes common sense, which is also the reason why it won't be successful, because seemingly the bizarro world that Donald Trump has brought to the Republican Party continues. So, look, Republicans have a huge problem. Um, anyone who has ever been involved in elections, anyone who knows anything about electoral politics knows that you want to have as many modes of systems of voting available to your voters. What do I mean by that? Well, if you only have people voting on one day, then you mean it means that people who are you know out of town that day, people who have an errand at the last day that day, people who had a snowstorm on that day, you know, are not going to vote. And so what what smart campaigns have realized is that you want as many people to vote by mail as you can. Why? Because if they don't vote by mail, they can still vote in person if they forget to vote by mail. You want as many people to vote early as possible. Why? Because if they show up, you know, uh, on a day of early vote and they see a line, they can come back the next day. Uh, if they are out of town unexpectedly or if their child gets sick or if there's bad weather, they can come back. Right. You want to give people as many different opportunities to vote because the voting process, honestly, in this country is not that easy. It's got a lot of rules and you want to make sure that people, that your supporters are not going to be dissuaded from voting because it's a very rigid one day of voting. So so every operative in the Republican Party, for sure, is in favor of vote by mail and early voting. Like there's no question. But their problem is Donald Trump has conditioned for four years plus now Republican voters not to trust early voting and not to trust vote by mail and not to want to do it. So the RNC, which is like a combination of professionals and also Trump sycophants, I mean, hell, we're soon going to have Donald Trump's daughter-in-law running part of the RNC. They're caught in the, the crossfire because the professionals are like, we definitely want people to bank their vote. And the Trump people are like, no, 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 we definitely want to perpetuate the big lie. And you can't do both. You can't do both effectively. You can't both have Donald Trump attacking vote by mail at the same time that the RNC is saying that people should be, be using vote by mail. And here's the kicker, Paige. It would be one thing if it was just the RNC saying one thing and Donald Trump saying another. But the RNC is also sending their lawyers into court all across the country, trying to convince judges to do away with vote by mail and to restrict early voting. And voters hear that too. So the RNC is like, on the one hand, it's professionals are saying this, it's lawyers are being told to say something that is preposterous from their standpoint of view, but they have to say they're losing those cases, which only then creates more of an aggrieved mentality among Donald Trump and his supporters. And then you've got Donald Trump lying on a regular basis about vote by mail, and that's dissuading them. Let's get into the lawsuits, and there's some pretty interesting data numbers behind them. So according to the Democracy Docket case database, the GOP is an involved party in 63 active lawsuits, and when we say the GOP, we mean the RNC, elected Republican officials, state or county parties, and affiliated groups. 29 of those lawsuits involve mail-in voting in some form, but the GOP has gotten involved in nine new lawsuits seeking to restrict mail-in voting since they announced the Bank Your Vote program. So after they started saying that everyone should vote early and vote by mail, they then got involved in nine new lawsuits to try to restrict mail-in voting. And Mark, see if you can tell anything about the states that they're litigating in. Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Mississippi, 
New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Those are states that the GOP is trying to restrict mail-in voting in since they've announced their new banker vote program. Right. And it's no surprise because what those have in common, with maybe the exception of Mississippi, which we'll talk about, is all of those are swing states or critical states to the outcome of the 2024 election. Obviously, Arizona, swing state for president, also a very, very important Senate race there and some House races. Georgia, swing state for president, uh, some important uh, House races there. Michigan, swing state for president. Very important Senate race, some important House races there. New York, as we've covered around redistricting, sort of ground zero for um, for the U.S. for control of the U.S. House. Pennsylvania, swing state for president, very important Senate race, very important uh, House races. And Ohio, obviously, uh, critical Senate race and some House races, Wisconsin swing state uh, all across the board. So, like, you can see the pattern here, right? This is the Republican National Committee picking the most important states for their most important elections and attacking vote by mail. So we're going to jump into discussing some of those individual states. But but before we do, Paige, you know, I, I want to reflect on some of the numbers you said. Um, 63 active lawsuits. You know, the Democracy Docket database is the gold standard. I mean, you know, you can go on democracydocket.com right now and you can click on cases and you will see, I don't know if it's 700 cases or nearly 700 cases, but you'll see. We're, we're almost at 700. Yeah, almost at 700 cases. So these are not cases that I'm necessarily involved in. This is the whole spectrum of cases. And so when Paige, you say, when you say that there are 63 active lawsuits. That means there are the, the Republicans are involved in 63 active lawsuits. Like that is taking a pretty broad lens of what is a uh, lawsuit uh, that falls into this category. Now, to be clear, it doesn't include um, redistricting. These are just voting rights cases. Um, but that number is should uh, terrify people <laughs> uh, and also, uh, you know, cause people to act. Right. Because 63 cases is a lot of cases like the Republican Party being involved in 63 cases um, shows the depth of their commitment to make it harder to vote in 2020. Um, and when you say that they that 29 of them involve mail in voting, you know, that's saying, Paige, roughly half of the cases that they are involved in are really about the core of this bank your vote program, right? They're at the core of th this attack on people being able to vote with some measure of convenience in their, in, in their lives. Right. The Republican Party has basically an all out legal assault going on against mail-in voting. But Mark, again, I just want to focus. They filed nine new lawsuits yeah. or got involved in nine new lawsuits about mail-in voting since they started telling people you should go vote early and you should vote by mail. Yeah. And I went to, after, after, you know, you told me in advance of the, of the show that, that number, I went on their website to try to like figure out like how the bank your vote portion of website intersects with the, we've gotten involved, involved in nine new lawsuits <laughs> to unbank your vote. Uh, and of course it, it doesn't like, there's no, there's no coherent theory to this. And I think that that is the reason why this isn't going to work. You know, go back to your first question. Like, why are they doing this and it's going to work? They're doing it because they understand they have an enormous problem and their problem is Donald Trump. The Republican Party has an enormous problem and that problem is Donald Trump. And they have no way out of that box. And they are desperate to figure out a way out of that box. Um, uh, so, you know, that's, that's where they wind up in this dilemma where they are simultaneously promoting something and attacking it at the same time. But let's talk actually about a few of the cases that I think are the most interesting, at least from my standpoint. Um, the first is in Pennsylvania where Republican lawmakers are challenging drop boxes and satellite election offices where voters can return mail-in ballots. Now, let us again, Paige, for the, I don't know, hundredth time? Millionth time millionth time, like just dissect these words, because I think people hear the words and they, they're kind of like, yeah, that's what the Republicans do. How stupid, like how nonsensical is this? Like what they are doing is not challenging who gets to vote absentee, although they do that separately, but this lawsuit is not a, who gets to vote absentee, how they get an absentee ballot, what they have to do to fill it out. 
It is literally how they return it, Paige. Right. And this is local boards of election in Pennsylvania. They set up county drop boxes or drop off sites or a satellite election office where people can return their completed mail-in ballots. Republicans are saying that's against state law. They only want people to be able to return their mail-in ballot via mail or at their respective polling place or precinct. And there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason for doing this other than to restrict mail-in voting options. You also have to remember, this is the same group of Republicans that tried to repeal the law that they wrote and passed that expanded mail-in voting. Yeah, I, I was listening earlier to a um, to a podcast, um, and I heard a Republican uh, voter or official say, well, I don't trust drop boxes because I saw a drop box and it was next to a parking lot. And I was sort of scratching my head like, and thus what? Like, like uh -huh. where, where, where would the drop box be um, if you are to drive your ballot and put it in a secure metal container? And Paige, you know, you've talked about this before. These drop boxes, they're no less secure than mailboxes. In fact, they're more secure than, than mailboxes that are like at people's street with a little flag that they put up uh, and or like on their house where people can walk up. Right. And you'll also oftentimes see, you know, a blue USPS mailbox right next to an official Dropbox ballot box. They're right there together. But that's yeah. Pennsylvania. Let's move to another major state, Wisconsin. Yeah, and the fight in Wisconsin is a really, really important one for the outcome, frankly, of the 2024 election and whether voters will be disenfranchised. So, you know, anyone who's ever voted by mail, you know the, the drill, right? You get your ballot and you have to fill in the little ovals or put a check mark or whatever, connect the line. You fill out the ballot, you put it in an envelope. In some states, you have to put that envelope in an envelope, which is a whole other story for another podcast page. We've talked about naked ballots before. Um, but in Wisconsin, that isn't the issue, right? In Wisconsin, you you fill out the ballot, you, you put it in, and then you complete the outer envelope um, uh, and, uh, you know, and you think you're done. Well, here's the thing. You're not done. You're not done. In Wisconsin, that whole process I just described, it has to be witnessed. Like literally you need another person watching you fill out your oval. Now they're not allowed to see who you vote for, but they have to see you in the process of doing it. They have to see you put it in an envelope. They have to see you say, say, seal the envelope, fill out the envelope. Then they have to fill out a certificate on the envelope. Also a total headache that causes disenfranchisement of voters. But just take a step back for a second page. Why the hell do you need someone to watch you vote? Like how, what is that doing other than disenfranchising voters? I mean, it's certainly not decreasing fraud that you have people watching people vote, right? You'd think like we went to a secret ballot system in this country precisely to prevent fraud. So like witness requirements don't make any sense. They are antiquated. They come from another era, but yet Wisconsin still has it. You know, there is a lot of litigation going on in Wisconsin about different aspects of the witness certification and the like. But Paige, the most fundamental question is why on earth do we allow states like Wisconsin, and it's not just Wisconsin, but like Wisconsin, to require witness requirements at all? Well, you know, you probably know since everyone watching this podcast um, subscribes to Democracy Docket. If you don't subscribe to Democracy, go to democracydocket.com right now, click on the subscribe link. You'll be happy you did. There's a link to that and also the new membership program in the in the show notes below. But if uh, if you have if you have forgotten, even though I'm sure you already all know this, um, there is a lawsuit pending in Wisconsin that challenges the witness requirement. And this is a vitally, vitally important lawsuit. In addition to all the other litigation in Wisconsin, it is a vitally important lawsuit to do away with this antiquated requirement that is frankly in violation of federal law, is in violation of the US Constitution. The Republican Party tried to intervene in this case because they wanna keep the witness requirement. Page, they want people disenfranchised, right? They're telling people to bank their vote and then they're telling, oh, by the way, you need to find someone to watch you vote and somehow that's gonna create less fraud. No, it's not. But that's because they don't want people voting by mail. They were denied intervention. The Wisconsin Republican legislature was granted intervention. So there is there are Republicans fighting in Wisconsin, Paige, as we sit here. There are Republicans spending money 
trying to prevent people from being able to vote without a witness, which is another way of saying trying to be, prevent people from being able to vote by mail. They do not want you banking your vote. So that's Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, which are maybe more traditional states where you would expect this kind of litigation. But the RNC has recently filed a lawsuit in Mississippi, of all places, challenging that state's mail-in ballot receipt deadline. Yeah. And you might ask the obvious question, why are they suing um, uh, uh, Mississippi? Um, it's for the same reasons that they filed basically the same kinds of lawsuits in Illinois and North Dakota. Right. They're they're bringing lawsuits challenging these ballot receipt deadlines that basically is whether the ballot has to be received by Election Day if it's a mail in ballot or simply has to be postmarked by Election Day. No one is arguing you should be able to vote after Election Day. The question is, if you are a military and overseas voter or you are in a remote part of uh, the United States and you put your ballot in the mail three days before the election, but due to no fault of your own, it gets delivered after the election, should it count? And state laws allow for this in some places, don't in others. And in Mississippi, they allow for it. In, uh, in Illinois, they allow for it. In North Dakota, they allow for it. And the Republican Party is spending its money to ban these practices. Now, why? There are two answers. The first is that they are simply trying to cast doubt on vote by mail by falsely suggesting that somehow people are voting after the election. OK, none of these states allow people to vote after the election. No state in the country allows it. It wouldn't be allowed. It wouldn't be permissible. But they are conflating the when ballots are voted and cast versus when they are received. So they are doing this to actually make people less trusting page. They are doing this to make people believe that something is fraudulent when it is totally normal. They are doing this because they are trying to demonize vote by mail. Mark, and the Mississippi law is pretty clear. Mississippi says the ballot has to be postmarked by Election Day and it can be received by officials up to five business days later. So all the states have cutoffs of when after the election a ballot has to be received by as long as it's sent by Election Day. It's a similar standard in North Dakota. It's a similar standard in Illinois. The lawsuits in Illinois and North Dakota were rejected after the DOJ and Republican officials both said that this deadline is really important for military and overseas voters to ensure that that group of voters don't get disenfranchised. These lawsuits are a really good example of how Republicans generally, not just in the voting context, you can see this in the abortion litigation context, the environmental rights litigation context, their playbook is they, they come up with a fringe theory which mischaracterizes what's going on, right? They're, they're somehow falsely suggesting that, that this is allowing illegal voting when it's not. They come up with a fringe theory to attack it. They oftentimes, not so much here, but in, the, but in many cases, they then launder this through academia, right? They kind of like get some right-wing academics to write a law review that says that this is a genuine problem or a genuine issue. Of course, academia has a lot of influence over judges, you know, especially if they're law school professors who write these things. And so you have a cadre of Republican judges up through the Federalist Society that sort of eat up these fringe legal theories. Then, and Paige, this is the state we're at, the, the place we're at in this, in this timeline now. Then what they do is they shop these legal theories, not to one court, but they shop it to a number of courts where they think they may get a favorable hearing. So why are they suing in Illinois? Why are they suing in Mississippi, right? These are not swing states. These are not states where this is going to make a big difference. They're doing it because they are trying to get a judge or an appeals court to bite on this fringe legal theory. Now, as you point out, they have not been able to do so so far, but Mississippi is their next effort. And their hope is that if they can get a court of appeals to bite on this theory and say, yes, this is illegal, then that gives them two things. It gives them legitimacy in future court cases, but it also gives them a circuit split. And what people need to understand is that one of the bases that the Supreme Court uses to determine what cases it takes is whether or not there is what's called a circuit split, which is one set of courts say the law is X and another set of courts say the law is not X. And so the Supreme Court has to resolve this. Now, Paige, what does this sound eerily familiar to? Well, it's the private right of action. 
right? It's section two, right? Why, why did they bring a case in, I'm sorry, in Arkansas in the, in the, in the eighth circuit to try to create no private right of action? Because they want to, again, launder this theory, right? That, that only the Department of Justice can inform the, enforce the Voting Rights Act. That would effectively gut the enforcement of the Voting Rights Act as a result. They want to bring it in a number of places. And if they can get some courts to say yes and some courts to say no, it creates panic on, among some, it creates anxiety, and it creates a circuit split. And so I think that's why they brought this case in Mississippi. So Republicans have filed all these lawsuits seeking to restrict mail-in voting in some specific states. Maybe they're filing this litigation in the hopes that they, you know, pick up a Supreme Court fight that makes a ruling that applies to all 50 states. Ronna McDaniel is now going to resign as the RNC chair, and she was kind of the face of the Bank Your Vote program. So what happens with that? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest question about Ron McDaniel is whether she's going to change her name back. I mean, she was she was Ronna uh, Romney for her entire professional career until Donald Trump decided he didn't like Romney because he didn't like Mitt Romney. So she changed her last name. So that's sort of the biggest question that I have. Otherwise, she's going to go into disgrace. Like she will go into she will be remembered and cursed by future generations for all of the bad things she did uh, to our country and to democracy. But the crazy thing is, Paige. The craziest of the crazy thing is that she was actually the pro voting by mail advocate, right? Like, I mean, the guy coming behind her, Michael Watley from North Carolina, he's being brought in because because Donald Trump thought Rona McDaniel was too good on voting. Like he, he thought that she was too permissive in voting. She was too she was not embracing the big lie enough as despicable as as her record on this has been. It's an incredibly low bar for the Republican Party that Ronna McDaniel can be described as pro vote, pro voting in general, but pro mail in voting specifically. Yeah, but she draws she she is in a long line of Republicans who have completely debased themselves, discredited themselves, humiliated themselves, all in service of a of a uh, of a failed one term president who tried to lead an insurrection and who exhibits absolutely no loyalty in return i mean absolutely no loyalty in return for everything she did she's gotten kicked to the tur- curb replaced by this other new vote suppressor from north carolina who promises to crack down on voting even more and that is what we face now as we head into november of 2024 so, Mark, speaking of November and this year's general election, how does this all pan out? I mean, look, we don't know how the election will turn out. I am very worried. I am very worried for our democracy. I am worried that we have not seen the worst of Republicans yet. We have not seen what a completely desperate, perhaps bankrupt Donald Trump will do. What a Donald Trump will do after he goes through his first criminal trial at the hands of uh, uh, the Manhattan DA, a trial that is not going to get moved and will come up uh, later this month. What a Republican Party will do when it is led by a leader, a new chair that wants to prove himself more worthy of voter suppression than the person he replaced. What we will do when you have Steve Bannon and people like him spewing hate day after day after day, what we will do when, frankly, Republicans united by the terror and the fear that they have instilled in their voters face an electorate that does not trust voting and therefore has no reason to turn out. We haven't seen that. We haven't seen the worst of the worst. So that is one of the messages I want people to to know. But you know, there is a there will be a special place in the history books for the lawyers who enabled this in the Republican Party. You know, each and every one of them went to law school, presumably to uphold and advance justice. Each and every one of them took an oath to uphold the highest ideals of the legal profession to uphold the professional rules of responsibility, to abide by the laws and the Constitution, to not abuse their status, their special privilege as lawyers. And it is those lawyers who have time and time again proven 
to be among the most destructive elements for our democracy. Rudy Giuliani was not just a a farcical character, he was a lawyer. Jenna Ellis was not just a laughable character, she was a lawyer. The lawyers we see in the courtrooms for him today are, who are perpetuating lies after lies and making mockeries of our judicial system. They are not just characters in a Donald Trump drama, even though some of them seem to want that. They are using their special privilege as, as officers of the court to advance injustice and to disadvantage our democracy and undermine our democracy for our next generation. And so what we're talking about today is just the latest iteration of this a generation of lawyers who are willing to use their law degrees to disenfranchise voters, to disenfranchise Democratic voters, disenfranchise Republican voters, disenfranchise minority and young voters, and disenfranchise old white voters. They are using their law degrees not to help people bank their vote, not to do the thing that every sensible Republican operative will tell you Republicans need to be doing, No, they're using their law degree to frustrate that and to undermine that. And they're doing it for one reason, because Donald Trump doesn't want you to bank your vote. Donald Trump doesn't want even Republicans to be able to vote at the expense of being able to cling to a lie that he didn't lose the 2020 election. And to not be able to cling to a lie after the 2024 election if he loses. And that is a shame that these lawyers will never, ever, ever be forgiven forgiven from. Thanks for listening to Preventing Democracy. You can find all of the cases and articles we mentioned today linked in the description of this episode. Look, if you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review. We read them all. And to find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and election news, visit democracydocket.com and subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters. And if you want our premium content, you can subscribe to that as well. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Ali Rothenberg, Gabri Corporal, and Paige Moskowitz. It was edited by Paige Moskowitz. Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.